So welcome, welcome uh, to Emotion Fest. Very glad to have you here. Um, I wanted to start by just uh, can we can we just show the second slide again? Um, I just wanted to start by setting the scene with with some um, research that I that I found about the size and value of the ARVR market. Um, the Goldman Sachs slide, they can they can bring it back on. Well, anyway. Um, what, what essentially what the graph shows is that the creative industries will fuel uh, the immersive tech sector and then the other sectors will come on. There it is. Uh, the next one. That's fine. Those, these guys have seen it, but you might want to see it. But basically that um, the creative sector will, will fuel the growth of immersive tech and then um, will be overtaken by value by enterprise functions by 2020. 223. So basically, you guys are, are going to be doing all the hard work in in setting up the immersive tech space. Um, and, I, and I think the reason um, that that film particularly can contribute so heavily uh, to immersive tech is because of the the skill sets that already exist within that you know within that film mo moving image um, sector. So I, I might start with you, Chet, and to talk about um, uh, you know. How are how you further helping with uh, developing those skill sets that will help um, the film, you know, the current set of um, film uh, crews transition into that immersive content space? Okay. Um, hi, hello everybody. Um, actually, there are, I just want to talk over two or three uh, slides that yeah. I've got with me. So, uh, can you load that PDF that I've been you should just slide the net and you should just step. No, yeah, so, so. Oh, actually, it's here. No, just go through like the. Keep going, right? It is not. Can you just get down while. Uh, Next week. Keep, keep going, see. I'll tell you when to stop. Yeah, yeah. Just go back. Back, back, back. One more. Yeah, that's it. One more. So, we've approached it in essentially these three ways. We looked at it on the tech side, we looked at it from the business side. <laughs> we looked at it from the tech side, from the business side, from, and then from the content, from the nature of content experience side. And then finally we got down to problem solving in the in the field. So, um, I mean, uh, tech-wise, I would start to say that it has stabilized. If you look at the, on the hype curve, the, this is the 2017 Gartner hype curve, 2018 Gartner, the Gartner hype curve, we are not on it anymore. Which means it's neither emerging nor is it a hype curve. It's settled down for the last 40 years, Gartner has been tracking emerging tech excellently yeah. well. This is, uh, again, we don't want to get too detailed into it, but a, a good understanding of VR. Yeah, so the, the, the core hypothesis of education or content creation education in any field is to enable people to be able to wrap their head around the technology of the time. If they're able to wrap their head around the technology of the time, they can tell a story. So whether it's a piece of charcoal which you use to do cave drawings or it's a complicated 360 rake pipeline, uh, if you are able to wrap your head around it, human being the natural storyteller, you will be able to tell a story. All our content creation education is derived education. Films are being made long before film education came around. Events happened long before event management education happened around. It is all derived education. And our goal is to Look, with the way we're looking at VR, we're looking at it as the fourth platform. So there's film, TV, and where our goal is every single Whistling Woods alumni should be able to do content in all the four platforms by the time the platform is stabilized in the market. So we're starting to build out the academic curriculum for this. Right? So, next. Uh, the business he's already spoken about. Now this is something that gives us hope. So this is quite recent. So what they did was they tracked consumer interest in VR. So if you look at movies, videos, seventy-five percent of the people who were surveyed said that yeah, I want to consume content in VR. The interesting part is of the people who are already owners, so who are already VR consumers, that percentage is more, which is a good indication that VR is not a let down. People are, it is meeting expectations, it is exceeding expectations, which is why the people who are already consumers, their interest in consuming it is more than people who never consumed 
uh, we are before. Right? So this is a good indication that it's here to stay. I don't want to get into business models, it's too much. This is the core. So on the right column, answering, solving all those question marks is going to be the core of creating the first generation of cinematic VR filmmaking, content creation. If you look at film, TV, digital and VR, AR and look at it across the structure of platform viewing details all the way down to USPs. Defining what the content structure is, defining what the, uh, the, the USP of that platform is will be the core on how content in this, in this area moves forward and the content creators, the first, second, third generation of content creators will be the ones that will start to define this. Uh, move on. Yeah. So, if you look at the problem solving, just keep going, I'll tell you at the stop. So, if you look at problem solving, keep going next. Like so, uh, there's standards, there's security, there's... Keep going. The, the, the VRIF is a global industry forum that's laying down some of the VR content creation platform distribution standards. Then there is uh, security is, a, is an issue, acquisition is an issue, computing, file formats, all these are issues, but none of them honestly are a content creation issue. They're all tech, they're all uh, manufacturers who are who need to solve both. Right? Go all the way down. Yeah, so our focus is this, our focus is to build awareness across industry brands and to build awareness across content creators. You know, far too many times we have had and you know, you'll bear me out on this, if people have gone to brand and said, ah, okay, this is fine that you want to do a VR experience, plus show us a 30 second proof of concept. It, it, you can't do that, it's not, it doesn't work like that. Because it, it's like pharma. Right? The, the second pill costs 40, cent, 40 cents, the first pill costs 400 million dollars. So you can't say that, yeah, give me the, you know, show me a sample, it doesn't work like that. Right? So that is the awareness and the most important bit is content creator. Create the first generation of content creators, which is why the lab is set up, which is why we are building out the curriculum, which is why we are building out what a filmmaker needs to learn to be able to tell content in the immersive but, but that was too quick. <laughs> we have Ashley on stage now. Ashley, do you want to just take um, a couple of seconds to introduce yourself? Hey guys, uh, I'm Ashley. I'm with VR Storytellers. Eddie and I are part of the team that uh, is behind Crackle, uh, India's first 360 horror short film uh, that has won the award at Miami Film Festival as, as we are content and so we are a content creation platform and uh, they are looking at creating more content than we are. Thanks for joining us. Um, so thanks um, uh, Chaitanya for, for, for those slides and for all of that information. So we are going to have a very skilled uh, group of people coming out um, that are going to be able to create all this immersive tech content particularly for the film and cinema uh, space. Vikramji, any, any, uh, sorry, Vikramji, any, um, um, uh, you know, thoughts on where the sector is headed, your, your macro view? Uh, before I start, can I have a bottle of water, please? You know, I feel like, I was just telling my good friend Luke, um, that I feel like I have just come out of Jurassic Park. I belong to an era uh, which is prehistoric in the film business, very distantly away from VR and AR from a contemporary new technology perspective. But well, there's always a beginning. And it was quite interesting, um, you know, when I got edited in life and I kind of wondered as to what I'd be doing here. And then I understood that uh, right now I head the film facilitation office of the government when their Ministry of Information Broadcasting which is housed here in the National Film Development Corporation. It functions like a film commission. The whole idea and the whole, thank you so much. The whole idea is to promote locations in India, to position India as a filming destination. And we've been successful in setting up an ecosystem 
whereby filmmakers internationally come and find it easy to navigate in India and shoot their films here. We've been, it's been three years now that we've been established. Uh, we're now open to domestic filmmakers. But before that, I, and I want to come back to this section a little later, but I want to put things in perspective. Um, Chaitanya has given you a huge perspective on the VR sector, so I'm not going to talk about that much. But to put things in perspective, where is the media and entertainment economy? Because it's very important for some of the players to understand the economy that they operate out of. So, the size, you know, uh, a guess work is around 1,436 billion is what they say. And give or take, plus minus 15% here and there. These are reports, ENY, KPMG. Um, the animation and the VFX sector and the gaming sector are the ones that are really moving on fast. So, if you look at the old school where I come from, which is television, film, print, radio, they're kind of growing at 9.5%, some at 3 point, print around 3.4%. But the animation in the VFX sector, which is currently valued at around 74 billion, is growing at 19%. And the gaming sector is growing at 36%. So your opportunities from a point of view of um, what you need to do is primarily to focus on these two sectors. And there's an immense contribution um, that when I talk to filmmakers who are coming in to shoot uh, in India, and when I talk to filmmakers from abroad, they're all going to do co-productions. And co-productions are not necessarily in cinema. Co-productions mean collaborations, even in the field of animation, VFX, and gaming. And that's where a lot of virtual reality comes in. I just want to tell you it's very interesting data and that I figured, you know, when we were looking at uh, the usage of smartphones because, you know, I'm kind of building this, we built this web portal which allows you, uh, if we have internet connectivity, can I just, uh, do we have internet connectivity, otherwise there's no issue. So if you log on to ffo.gov.in, ffo.gov.in, you get to see the entire country in terms of the glory of the diversity of locations, the co-production treaties, um, all the big players who are in the animation VFX post-production business, um, the various state governments and their nodal officers. So again, I'll come back to that a little later. Um, it's very interesting that you know we've been talking to uh, our developers who were building the portal, and I said, how much really uh, do people spend time in terms of hours? on the internet, on, on the uh, phone. And they were telling me that time spent on online video in terms of hours, um, in the 15 to 19 segment is 1.26 hours per week. In my segment, which is the 44 to 55, 1.27 hours per week. Which is supposed to show me that age is actually not a barrier. So for those of you who are in this business, that's another thing for you to kind of take into account. Then I said, you know, what about, okay, this is age, but how if you go across town, because a lot of people think uh, that, you know, VR, AR, these are all urban, English-speaking, English-talking kind of phenomena. And again, we looked at online consumption. Uh, the top eight cities, 1.26 hours approximately, the ones below one lakh are around 1.44. Of course, a lot of that consumption is towards um, to its porn, but there's a lot of shift that is actually happening um, to watch short content and other kind of content, uh, news, etc. But you know, the biggest factor in my mind, which is going to drive the overall media and entertainment industry, where you are, one part of it is the TMD factor. So there's technology, telecom, and media, which is kind of converging to give you that play. So I sometimes wonder with the geo is actually a telecom major or an entertainment major. I kind of see what Facebook acquiring, uh, you know, now with their videos and then going on to do a lot of, are they a media house? Uh, they were a social media group. What are they now? Are they more of an entertainment studio? Um, if you look at again, AT&T buying Warner Brothers, and that's a deal of 85.4 billion. If you look at the Disney-Fox merger, where is this coming from? This is coming from convergence. 
And in convergence is where the virtual reality players, the developers, the hardware, the software, these are the guys who are going to make that difference and who are going to take this wave forward. Um, I want to share a little bit else. Um, if I were to look at some data that I picked up, I won't go into the details because uh, Jatin has shared that. Um, I'm told that the startups apparently uh, in this sector are the ones that are going to drive the growth in the virtual reality sector. And a figure that I have is that in 2018, uh, this is a 3.8 billion INR market size, the entire virtual reality, augmented reality sector, growing at around 35% as I said, but out of which gaming of course is around 89%, 88.8% is what they say. Um, I believe there are around 500 old startups. And funding is going to be a key, key driver to the growth of these startups. So I'm sure uh, there should be a lot of time spent here and amongst all the industry players in terms of how and where that funding is going to come from. Uh, maybe uh, some of you, when you go back to the cities that you come from, can start talking to your government and saying that, look, is there, because there is a skill development platform that the government has in their hands. And uh, I'm sure under that skill development uh, platform, you would probably find some kind of uh, funding available to you. So I, it's very important that you go back to the cities that you come from, start talking to your local state governments, in trying to figure out whether there could be some kind of soft loans, etc., for you to develop your work. Um, again, I'm told that um, there's an estimated 203.4 billion funding which came in in 2017. So we just show that this sector it definitely attracts a lot of money. Um, you just have to know kind of where to pick it up from. Um, I won't go into the courses from an educational institution point of view. We've already spoken about that. Let me come into where I come from. Now, having given you a little bit of a macro scenario, we're a film commission. I would love to meet with developers who can tell me how I can transport a filmmaker. I tell them you want to come and shoot in India. And you know, the noise, the dust, the uh, beautiful scenes that you have in India, the color, the smell, the aroma, the chaos. India is such a fascinating place for everybody who is people. Imagine I could transport them instead of taking them onto my web portal, or perhaps in my web portal, transport them to a virtual India that they can actually be in a natural Pradesh and say, why can I shoot a lot of the rings here? Um, it's called Wiki the World. Okay, Wiki the World. We, we'd love to meet some local players uh, to have a conversation and see if we can have that on our platform. Um, for instance, I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean could have been shot in Andamans. You could have Kashmir representing something, and so on and so forth. With our enormous ambitions that we have, and the biggest part of India is its strength of the film industry. And that strength is where we're leveraging and saying, look, you can go to the rest of the world, but you know what? You want to unlock your narrative, you want to come home to your imagination, you come to India. You come and work here. You come with your script, with your idea, you come with your script, you go out to the finished product, that's what we do for you. That's what our capacity is, that's what our capability is. So as a film commission, I'm happy to listen to um, a lot of what the developers are saying because we would love to showcase the kind of work. We, as I said, we're on a learning curve here. We're just three years old. And I'm sure as we develop our application for domestic filmmakers to come in and make it easy for them to film, I'm sure the next step is going to be how we take the future generation technologies and promote them worldwide and tell filmmakers around the world that look, you can leverage and you can tap the talent which is in India and cross fertilize. And that's why collaboration and co-production is going to be the way forward. I leave it at that and I'm sure through other discussions we will uh, find more thoughts. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to just take forward that what you are asking to be done is already happening, starting to happen. So Reiki the World that I produced a platform that one of our alumni who done some amount of VR work has launched. So he's got teams traveling to various parts of the world and shooting some key areas, key locations in uh, 360 to enable people to be able to see 
whether that would be the right place to move without actually having to travel to you know, wherever parts of India. So I put them in touch with them, definitely. So I think they have done uh, 10 15 locations in India and then some other around the world. So uh, yeah, it's a new point, not kid anymore. But, uh, <laughs> It's a good healthy business within the industry. Most people look at our industry as a B2C yeah. content creation industry, but this is a good B2B B2B business. Not really. uh, talking about B2C, I think we have two guys on stage who have actually made um, immersive films and they're, they're available to um, view outside in the exhibition area. So I might start with you, Sarah. Um, uh, tell us a bit about that, about that process of making um, an immersive film and, and what were some of the um, challenges and also what what was you know what was the most fulfilling aspect as well. Can, can you guys hear him? No. Yes. Yeah, so uh, starting with the beginning of VR for me as a filmmaker, uh, there were some problems initially, challenges I would like to call them. Uh, that's something that people like Chaitanya are trying to solve. Uh, they're producing uh, the first generation of trained VR filmmakers. It wasn't the case with us uh, when, we, when we started, we had to build our rigs ourselves use different lens hats, uh, but yeah, those days are long gone, you have solutions that you can just pick off the shelf. Uh, and just last week, uh, Facebook in collaboration with Startup Village in Bangalore had their uh, convocation for, again, the first batch of uh, VR passwords. Uh, they were of course uh, trained not in filmmaking, but with Unity and gamified VR experiences. I must say though, uh, the work that these students put out after just a few months of training, it was spectacular and that's something that I missed. Maybe there'll come a day where I might have to go back to Chaitanya to school myself. To teach. To teach and also to learn. Uh, uh, so, the beginning of our journey, I'd like to go back in time. So, uh, how did we learn? Uh, you all heard of housing.com? the infamous uh, the CEO, there's a lot of drama between the board and the CEO. So I joined much before that started and we I was heading content creation then. And uh, the, the culture in housing.com was such that there was a lot of freedom for us to uh, explore new technology and uh, implement that. So that's how we uh, started to invite people from Hollywood. We got in a stereoscopic specialist, uh, one who's worked on Avatar, and we learned stereoscopic 3D filming, and then we moved on to VR, just to capture spaces, right? Uh, and I had a filmmaking background, back in, my hand, uh, back in my mind, I was always thinking of how I could use this medium to tell stories. And then once a bunch of us came out of uh, housing.com, we decided to start Miraki. And we, so there were some good parts about housing.com. And I must say, at least three VR startups today uh, have their um, genesis in housing.com. There's good now. Yeah, a lot of them. And uh, yeah, so that's how it started in Bit2. Uh, one thing that worked out for us was we, we were able to acquire a lot of assets, be it software or hardware. And then we just started making and then. It, we are now three years, three and a half years running. We created over 50 experiences and worked across verticals, be it sports, where uh, in 2015 when India and Pakistan were playing their Asia Cup uh, in Bangladesh, we shot the VR experience then. And that happens to be the first VR experience for cricket anywhere, anywhere in the world. And uh, same with Bollywood when we start, when we shot Phobia's VR experience with Radhika uh, I think that was again the first for Bollywood. And, and then yes, we've been industry agnostic to work with uh, tourism, sports, events, and a lot of brand experiences. Uh, Pops, who was here in the earlier session, 
we work with uh, oh, Pops to create an experience for yeah. Nescafe, yeah. which is one of our recent experiences, and we work with quite a few brands. So, I maybe the next. Thanks. Yeah. Mm. Ashley, do you want to talk about your film making journey? Okay, we started off much later. We Can you guys hear? Yeah. yeah. So, we are filmmakers ourselves. We are producers, and uh, a client of ours came up to us and said, "Can we do something in verses?" And uh, we want to create the world's first interactive VR travel app. Uh, so they came up to us and we said, yes, we'll do it. So we figured out that there were not many, too many players doing it in India then, uh, in 2016. Uh, so we created our own rig. We created an 18-camera rig uh, for students to create uh, filmmaking. We created our own robotic trolley. Uh, we wasted a lot of time in the tech then, then rather than creative. So we did that whole process a couple of years when I and then uh, we went and we got uh, decided to make our own film uh, called Crackle. Uh, we decided first we will get directors and we will just produce it. And we realized that directors didn't understand the concept of K60 music. And since we had done two projects for Teddy, we said we so we directed, produced it, shot it ourselves, and uh, and it turned out well. It was a good experience, and that's it. Uh, can I have Yeah. <laughs> so, for both of you, how much time do you think? I mean, did the trying to figure out the tech kind of take away from? Would you rather have put that energy into the yeah. structure into the creative uh, yeah. into the? Now I think we can. Earlier we didn't have that ability or the luxury, but we didn't have cameras available here. We couldn't. So our first shoot, our camera wasn't ready. We had to rent out the Ozo from China, and so, so I think we spent the first few years, I mean the first years, so we spent a lot of time behind the tech, and we would have spent much more energy in the radio. And so now it's much easier. Cameras available, and it's much, 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 stitching time is much much faster compared to. Uh, but to hear the for a 30 second stitch at the beginning. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, you know, going from my own experience, the way I see it is that co production and collaboration is going to be a big way. And we ask developers primarily. Uh, that have they ever thought of taking their films and their content to certain content markets like maybe Mekong, which happens in Cannes in France, or some of the other markets which, are, which would be probably there for virtual reality and augmented reality kind of uh, content? Have you guys ever thought of that? Well, uh, we did. Uh, so, uh, there's a company called Ascape that creates uh, travel experiences. So, they acquired uh, some of the films. Uh, beyond that, I think they did because our films were mostly for clients. And yeah, so our in house productions are very few. So, it's, it's that one reason that it stops us. What, I, what I've also been told uh, by international sources is that this is you know, for short form documentaries, mm -hmm. but the VR is very good. Now there's a, there are two markets in the world which are, you know, there are a whole lot of documentary markets, but TIFF, which is the Toronto International Film Festival, has a specific documentary market. Uh, IFA, which is in Amsterdam, uh, in Netherlands, has a, is one of the key markets for documentary filmmakers. There is Sheffield, there's one in, one in Greece. Um, there, are, there are these four or five markets which are really interesting uh, if developers and uh, the virtual reality studios which are here where to visit and interact and see what kind of narratives are coming out in this particular segment. You see the narrative of a short film or a narrative of a documentary or a feature done in the normal uh, cinematic or for a television format or web format which is not virtual reality to speak of uh, would be completely different. Whereas your narrative would be again very very different. So I think uh, there is a lot of need for uh, script development in this area. There's a lot of need for international exposure. There's a lot of need for technology uh, in terms of uh, you know how we keep up the envelope. So is that something as an industry that I'm new to this uh, to this field? And I would like to ask you guys, since you're all experts, you, 
is that in law learning is uh, you know, which is kind of, you know, I've read your emails and we're doing a lot of stuff and that's are you seeing that kind of movement happening in India? So, we are in India right now is what film making was in <laughs> 1930. We are fairly, for lack of a better word, struggle media. We are struggling to uh, get to a point where the ecosystem is streamlined and so is the ecosystem in terms of distribution? Or is the ecosystem in terms of tech? Okay. The pipeline. The pipeline. So whether it's, and this is not just with, with India, actually it's almost everywhere. If you see the content experiences being created, 99.9% of them are at a high value, low volume. Right? So they're very, very, very expensive to make and hence they are of a particular standard which are viewed by very, very few people. So the, in the, the value volume mix, which is actually one of the slides that I skipped, in the value volume mix, you have to make sure that you have high volume, low value, which is your YouTube equivalent. And then you have your location based entertainment, which is high value, low volume, which is what you see in a lot of festivals. So like Venice last year had 140 odd in the in the VR pavilion, had 140 odd experience. 70 of them were installation. So they could not be seen anywhere other than there. They were not mobile, they were not portable, hence they, they, they didn't have a Whereas the other 40 were, and they are on the Oculus uh, Studio, they are on the Oculus Store, they are on the Steam VR, some of them are on Facebook, some of them are on YouTube. So, digital distribution is just starting to pick up. But because the industry itself is still coming together, it will take a little bit of time. So, I give it about 18 months before you start to see a global market evolution. You don't even, at this point of time, you don't even have a, a single format. Right? In digital distribution, you had the DCP. Before the DCP came around, there was just wild, everyone was running wild with their own content formats, right? platforms or whatever you call it. Same thing happening in VR right now. There isn't a, a, a single pipeline which is set. So it will take some time before uh, the world gets down to, to uh, what should I say? Structuring and organizing itself both on the content creation and on the trade side. So, yeah, I mean, we will get there eventually, but it will take a little bit. Yes, I had, that, I had a question around that around that distribution framework in terms of we were talking earlier about how PVR has set up one of their um, yeah, VR right. cinemas in, uh, up in North India, and but you haven't seen that really being replicated elsewhere, and it's possibly because it's quite expensive. So, do you see um, you know, immersive films? being distributed through that sort of cinematic experience going out to a theatre or is it going to move, you know, jump that whole uh, stage and move straight into the uh, direct-to-home digital uh, consumption platform? I don't think it will, the uh, cinematic, uh, there's nothing we'll go to theatres to watch the other We will be uh, digital headset. Uh, see, we, uh, I, I don't like to be uh, existential with my approach, <laughs> but honestly, I do not know what, uh, about what the adoption bit. Yeah. So, is VR doing a habit? Has it become a habit? Honestly, I don't see that happening. Yeah. So, it's been strictly on ground experiences where brands have been pushing. And this is really, really my new uh, market that's, that's, that's uh, actually the ones that are interested in the medium and have made uh, watching content on VR a habit because initially it was a problem with the headsets, they were expensive. Uh, but uh, the Oculus Go is not relatively expensive, it's still affordable. But uh, that's something that I've yet to see. Watching VR as a habit, will that happen? So essentially it is that that will drive adoption. So without that, you it, it's still going to be largely a B2B market. Yeah. Yeah. As well as yeah. content. When it comes to business models, I see about five distinct business models laying out. I think 24 months from now, this is what we will see on the value volume mix. So you will have your high volume, low value content, which will be mobile plus headset. Today, for $110 in India, you are the other. 
And yet, at current decent VR ready mobile for about 7 8,000 rupees, 7,000 rupees, and a decent headset with glass lenses and a clicker comes about 400 rupees. So, 110 dollars your VR ready. However, that does not have all the other nice trappings of spatial audio, of you know, lightweight and fancy and etc. 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 head tracking and all. It doesn't have. But it still exists. So that's your YouTube. That's where you're going to see a lot of um, uh, shorter fiction as well as non-fiction content coming around. You have your handheld devices and VR devices are starting to get better. Like, uh, uh, this company called Canada Obsidian, they've launched something like what we call a Bukea. It's nothing bigger than a stick and it shoots in 4K, uh, not great quality but decent. So it's good enough. Right? The next step we move on to is what you we call the Oculus Go, which is also called standalone, which are wireless connected headsets. So they're connected to the internet via Wi Fi or eventually through a SIM. But they're wireless. Those are the ones that give you the most mobility, those are the ones that are cheaper, that don't need a computer, that don't need any of that, need just good internet connection. So those are today available uh, overseas for about $200, by the time they get to India, it comes about $400. Right? That will start to get cheap. So that's your Netflix, Amazon Prime kind of market. Oh, slightly more premium content, slightly lower in volume, but more in value. Then you go straight to the home theater, which is your computer plus wired headset, which is your Oculus Rift or your HTC Live or whatever else comes around. Now the Vive and the Rift, why on just of the power of the headset, they're not great, they're okay. The reason why they sell so well is because they build the content store ecosystem behind it. Vive has the Steam behind it, Oculus has its own store. So because content is available, which you can see only on the Rift, people get the Rift. Yeah. Right? So that's the goal. Next, tomorrow Geo launches a headset and has a content, content store on the yeah. Earth. People may not get these, right? You know, would probably get that, right? So that will start to emerge, right? Like your OTT platform. India has 30 OTT platforms today, right? So similarly, that is the kind of things that will happen. Now, you take that and you add in a seated experience with, uh, you know, the seat chains a little bit and all that, which Intel is doing, which they did very well for Dunkirk and for Lehman's uh, VR film, yeah. Le Mans. That then takes it to a whole other level. So that's home theater plus, that's home theater with surround sound. Yeah. And then finally is your LV, location based experience. Uh -huh. So like the void or the jackpot experience that yeah. people have created, which 0 0.0001% of the world will see, but that's the word of mouth. That's the catalyst that will drive the word of mouth publicity that VR is possible. Awesome. Awesome. Right? So these are the five business models that I start to emerge, that I see emerging. Yeah. Now, just one kind of factor to this is, now this is a hypothesis, I don't know if it will happen, but I have a feeling that, I'm actually pretty confident that VR will be within the short fiction market. The short fiction market today, no matter how much we say, you know, great content or not, is not a financial viable market. Yeah. Right? And one of the reasons is because we are used to longer format content, so the brevity leaves us feeling that we are pura nigga, the kuch, or say, any moment. The immersion and the impact that the narrative immersion, emotional immersion brings to the content will more than make up for the content. So I start I start to see a significant amount of short fiction content emerging right, as a regular content viewing experience, both standalone and serial in nature. People travel two hours on a train, one and a half hours on a train, they are watching it on their cell. Nothing stops them from wearing the headset and still sitting in the train, right? So it will, all this will start to come around. Um, but one of the things, as a, as a consumer of, of content, uh, you know, one of the joys of, of cinema is that it's a shared experience. That you're not isolated, you're not in a headset, you're not in a pod, you're, you're sitting there, you're, you know, with your date, with your family, it's, it's that shared experience. So, um, you know, and I know that there is technology which basically they create a dome where multiple users can go in and experience that immersive content together. Do you see that fitting in anywhere? I, I think that, that kind of a thing, uh, 
good player of music. Uh, you know, I love to sing music as well. And you know, if you go to New York, you go to London now with the uh, music here in federal music that has come out. Uh, there are a lot of filmmakers who are actually gravitating towards a uh, very unique kind of art form which you can see otherwise which are, which are art immersion in a very, very big way. And uh, they kind of, you know, taking inspirations, uh, creative thoughts that come from art uh, into narratives which would allow that particular views of the viewer, niche of course, uh, not much more. Uh, but in the music is where I'm seeing that this kind of a shared experience might, might work. So imagine uh, you were to create a virtual reality or um, say um, what what the sack is in you know, in, in the in the days of Neo or the Roman Emperor, you, know, yeah. you were to go and do a you know a virtual reality experience in China during the uh, the Great War of China. Or you yeah. pick up anything you want. Yeah. Um, so not just war, but even art, uh, for example. Um, you see the big museums in uh, Italy, where you have so much of uh, the um, kind of the politics of art itself, and uh, you know, for people who want to ex explore that bit in terms of fine studies, uh, in terms of their academia, uh, this is a big, big uh, yeah. narrative. It's, it's, and it's not just art museums; it's also natural history museums, you know, Attenborough, or, or even. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you look at if you look at it platform wise. And one of the kind of things that people have been doing with, with, with VR is they've been trying to force fit it into a content platform that it is in. Mm. It is not a community viewing platform. Right. It is not. Mm. There's captive community viewing, which is film. There's non captive family viewing, which is television. There is non captive individual viewing, which is digital, web and mobile. And there is captive individual viewing, which is VR. Right? Every type of content in this format also informs the kind of content that gets prepared for it. Hence, film is an audiovisual narrative spectacle. Yeah. Right? Hence, television is appointment viewing, story and character development. You keep coming back to yeah. the family in mind. So one of the reasons why digital content is so edgy is because it's individual viewing. Yeah. So nobody is judging you for viewing. So you can watch whatever you want, which is why almost anything gets made online. Right? Now, same thing will happen here. It is an individual viewing platform by code. Yeah. And that USB should be maintained. You may decide to morph it into a, a Sharing. community yeah. viewing platform. But I think what essentially will, I think what will start to happen is I think on the live VR front, we will start to have shared viewing within the virtual space. Supporting space. and within the virtual space. Also. So for example, Saira may be in Bangalore, I may be in Bangalore. But both of us would be in the owner's box of a uh, NBA game, yeah. watching the game together. If I look to my left, I see Sairam's avatar. If he looks to his right, he sees my digital avatar. Yeah. Both of us are watching that live sporting event in VR yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So yes, in a way, it is community viewing, yeah. but it is not as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's and I think know that is what that those are the dynamics. And I and I know that there's a session tomorrow about. Um, about this, uh, in, you know, music and live events and sports. So I'm sure that will be covered. I think you wanted to make one point, but we'll have to wrap up after that. We're out of time. So uh, yes, um, VR is an individual, individualistic experience, but there are two scale experiences that involve multiplayer environments. Well, that is of course uh, the void of that uh, and uh, very exclusive installation uh, installations that happen in. Uh, any other like uh, so commercially it was deployed by IMAX. So IMAX VR um, spaces were uh, some one place that I explored in New York. Um, but then again, so the moment you make it participative with multiplayer, when does it stop becoming a film? When does it become a game? So it's yeah. not so much. Yeah. Yeah. If you see actually a very similar experience is what is what's been happening right next door for the last 20 years. This is the planet area. Yeah. It is community. Yeah. Community VR. Yeah. If you look at it. It's not stereoscopic, nobody wearing glasses or anything yeah. of the sort. But it is spatial sound, it is directional sound, it is uh, community and it is immersive. Yeah. 
So it's happening already. It's been happening for 20 years. I'm mean, there as a child. Right? So it's there. But now, I don't know if I want to watch a narrative format or it's rather a fiction format. Even that is narrative. There's still a the viewer. There is a story. Yeah. Right? So it's still narrative, but it's not necessarily fiction. So I think these mini content formats will find yeah. their own. You mean mechanics? Before you wrap up, I've asked both these gentlemen, since they are from the hardcore industry, is how are you guys seeing your future? What, what are your future strategies going to be? Uh, and be rich? So, uh, both by our experience with the market, so uh, the demand for the industry has been less than 700 mm -hmm. in the last few months, more of interactive experiences. So, uh, brands want to engage their yeah, uh, uh, customers in a much more complex way, uh, discover products and experience through interactive experience. Mm -hmm. So we're moving towards interactive and uh, so we as we as studio decided to uh, build capabilities and interactive and make it more technical. So we're looking at solving problems for our brands. Yes, uh, it's, it's it's in a way moving away from what we started, which is cinematic. And I think Neil is focused on the acquiring cinematic content and we focus on the cinematic part of it. Random things will happen and that will be the money, but uh, we will focus on uh, cinematic VR. Yeah. I mean, the, there is no content format today that exists. If there isn't fiction narrative content. Unless that exists, you see, in whether it's actual, whether it's uh, documentary is the narrative, but actual brings up. VR is additive to the to the core messaging. Any platform that is additive will always have a limited value addition. Hence, it will never be able to sustain on a long term basis. Eventually, it will die out. Which will happen to 3D. Right? 3D was additive to narrative fiction, narrative audio visual storytelling. And it eventually died out because the value addition stopped. Because people didn't see the value of the key game. So, until and unless you have fiction, core fiction narrative content for that it's platform, requires, the platform so so I think that work will continue when, you know, whether it's Sairam, whether it's uh, Eddie, whether it's uh, Ashley, whether it's us, our way going forward, it will, I think it will just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And, you know, today, Hilary Q is doing it, tomorrow there will be 5,000 of them going forward. It's the fourth platform and it will take on all the characteristics that digital did over its journey from starting from MRAS, right? On those small feature phones and whatever we used to do. From there to where the OTT and digital is on today, so much so that the lines are blurred between TV and OTT. I think that's going to start to happen in VR as well. You're going to be able to do picture in picture, you're going to be able to do lots of things. So wait for 5G, wait for the tech pipeline to stabilize a little bit and then there'll be a big issue. So on that optimistic note, I'd like to wrap up, wrap up the session. Thanks so much guys for being on stage and for joining us at this festival. Thank, Thank you. you.